Foro. We have Ray Lambert, Mary Helen Tekin, Jake Fuller, Fred Gonzalez, Jason Talley. We do have a forum. The Economic Director. Uh, absent, we do have Chris Alamantes and Andy Jocelyn. And we have a, a director, Tommy Baker, with us also. <coughs> Mary Helen Deacon will lead us in the picture. Hello, oh, Father, we ask your guidance for the meeting tonight that our ears be open to the information that we're going to hear. And Please give us the discernment to make good decisions. And we are thankful that Jay's wife had a good report. Grateful, very grateful for that. And we ask for everyone's blessings for their health, for the children, for the families, and for peace in this world. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. The liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas. One, one state, state under God, God one and indivisible. Thank you. We've <coughs> also now been joined by City Manager Henry Turner. <coughs> Do any citizens' comments? Yes. Are you a citizen? <laughs> yes. Okay. I have a driver's license. All right. I'm not on the agenda, but I was given a homework assignment last time I was here. Thank you, Ms. Italia. I appreciate it. So what I did was I killed a tree. Yes. We went down to Gaines uh, as a model. Remember we talked about the being developer friendly. So we went and got a uh, Gaines packet about what they pass out. So I have a sample here of what Gaines has. So that's what Seguin does. And then you all told me to look at Lavernia. Because that's another good sample to look at. Here's Lavernia. And last, and certainly not least, here's Floresville Draft of Architects. So this is just a draft we put together. Now the permits actually attached to that um, actually are what we're using right now. Okay? So we wanted to put together a little packet or whatever. So if you have any comments or don't tear it apart. I haven't mass produced these other than what's in this room. But we wanted to give you a, a basis of what we based about. But Bernie is a sample. Seguin is a sample. Uh, Pope really didn't have as much of a package together as this, so we wanted to uh, so we can compare those. Okay? Uh, and then I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. It's a lot of work doing that. Sure. Okay, so another thing I did, SWOT analysis that we did at your alliance, that Tommy's going to be um, reporting on later. Um, here's the SWOT analysis itself that we ask people to do. So I want to see what you look at. As you know, talk about our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you can do it actually with any project. So that's what I gave to people <coughs> at your breakfast. Here are their, it was how many, how many people? 12? 16. 16 answers. So here are their answers. I've compiled them. We're just trying to see where we are right now today. Okay. Um, of people's comments and things like that. We're going to hopefully come back with the uh, total we're going to try to give. You can submit yours. It's only three comments of each one. Um, in your SWOT analysis, you have exactly what the, the acronym stands for. Then you have your history of 1999. Someone provided for me. <laughs> uh, when, when they did a SWOT analysis in 1999, uh, this is what they thought our strengths, weaknesses, and threats were. And then, of course, you can just fill out a simple little form to say what they are. Yeah. Who, who was at this meeting? Your breakfast alliance. Your alliance, your business alliance that we have. That's why we're going to do uh, the same thing for the people that uh, are new to the breakfast or come and fill one out. So we get three months of analysis <coughs> measuring 16. Something has but, happened every time. There's two meetings now. I, I just had one. 
Oh, uh, two. Have I missed this one? I'm sorry? Did I miss this month? Um, it's been postponed, and, and it'll be in my notes. But. So I wanted to have an opportunity to put that out since I'm not in the minute. I'm okay with that. Appreciate it. But I wanted to give it to you. I did my homework. So really the, great job. The minutes can reflect. I did my homework. <laughs> <laughs> so noted. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Has anyone had a chance to, <clears throat> to look at the old minutes? I don't know whether it's important or not, but whenever we approved the minutes at the last meeting, we approved them with some changes, and that's not noted in the, in, in the minutes. <clears throat> Fred had some, I had some. Yeah, we, we had one under G, we, and, and on just a little correction there, J and I also attended that meeting. Under which one? Under G, on your on your old business. Oh, okay. The workshop. Yeah. I don't know. We had another one. Oh, the question, Jack? It was one of them, I guess. I don't remember. <laughs> to stand corrected on item G that Fred as well as Jay did attend the, the uh, workshop. Mark number two up in the right hand. Well, there should be another one in there. Okay. We're, we're, it's in the package sometimes. Oh, th this, this is an old one, is it? The one you're referring to? Uh, no, let me see. Well, this is what came in my packet. Oh, uh, okay. Just need, it's okay, just go ahead. Well, here, here's, here's, here's some more packets. There's one right in front of you there. Oh, here you go. <clears throat> this one? Got it? This is all mine. That's it. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, so, um, you know, if you recall, the we put together this real simple format, uh, thanks to Connie uh, doing this. You see the total of funds collected over there on the left, and you see the month's um, revenues. You see the current expenditures. Now, if you notice, the current expenditures are going to exceed that month's revenues. Uh, part of that is a check written for the contracting going on at the business park. Uh, we're going to have a, a budget amendment tonight that we'll propose that will rectify that accounting and the budget so that we'll get that all balanced out. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. You see what the revenue is uh, down in that lower left-hand corner uh, for the month of February. So a good strong month there in terms of revenue. And then of course you see the uh, unaudited fund balance there, there at the middle bottom. Turn the page. <coughs> we'll get into uh, some of the more details. Yeah, excuse me, but what? for February being a short month, right? I know. Now that actually would be uh, probably January. Yeah, it, January? it is January. Well, it's always a month behind. It's but January. January. Okay. Yeah, it's January. And it does reflect that Forgel is doing much so better we'll than without it. We'll see an um, Excel spreadsheet that shows the comparisons. We're still ahead of, of the <coughs> I was just thinking maybe it was Valentine's Day. I'm kidding. Could be. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and go to the uh, revenue side of the uh, page one. You see the current period. You see the total revenue there. 
with additional amounts, which are those loan payments that you see each month, comes to the total of $86,004.72. And then you see year-to-date actual. So really, revenue-wise, we're doing real well. Then if you um, go on to page two, you know, starting at the top, second column is the expenses, mainly for personnel, which is the standard expenses that we have each month. Uh, <coughs> miscellaneous expenses there. Coming on down, some legal, general accounting, which is a fee that we pay every month. Okay, so nothing really out of norm there. And so, in terms of you know budgeted items uh, or those categories, we're still doing really well there. If you turn the page to page three, you notice a under the current period a bond payment. I think we mentioned that at the last meeting that that would be coming up. And uh, in addition, in your packet, you should have a bond schedule of debt payments that we'll be seeing. Uh, the next one would occur in September. Okay. okay. Um, Tommy, just one quick question. Uh, the property swap, is that like real, real soon? Or because we keep reporting expenses. No revenue, well, a little bit of revenue. It's, it's on the agenda for Thursday for the okay. City Council to transfer the property. Uh, all attorneys have agreed, and uh, the question was in a local agreement, but uh, they opted to put it on the deed so we don't have to do it in a local agreement. Uh, so the exchange for the rent versus the property is all in the deed. We don't have to do another agreement. But that's on the agenda for approval on Thursday. They keep asking me a question. I have a dollar figure in my mind. Uh, kind of usable answer this question for me. But you all set aside a park budget of somewhere around, is it 15000 That's correct. Based on a plan, once we have a plan presented to uh, the council to approve, because they keep are they going to approve the park? Since if they do have a budget set aside, uh, they're waiting for a project or a plan to be presented so that you can earmark at least 15, maybe no more, depending on what the project is. <coughs> So hopefully it'll pass on Thursday. Okay. So uh, expenses there were just simply some expenses there at the beer warehouse, and that will be <coughs> transferred as you just heard. Uh, <coughs> Depot, same thing. Hydric property, nothing's changed there. Uh, we get to the business park property, uh, the industrial park, and uh, you know if you look at the top right, you see we're kind of out of whack there because of. You know, when we did the construction project, it wasn't necessarily uh, a budgeted item because at the time when the budget was formulated, we really didn't have the bids in yet and all that good stuff. So now we know exactly what the cost is. We were paying for that out of reserves anyway. We, uh, I got with Connie, or actually Tommy got with Connie, and then I followed up a little bit, and we fixed that by adjusting those entries in the budget. You'll see this in, here in a little bit. Uh, Veterans Park, nothing changed there. And then, of course, this next page um, <clears throat> just shows the total expenditures and uh, it shows a little deficit for that month just because of those uh, payments to the contractor. Okay, so if you go to the spreadsheet now, this is the tax revenue you're familiar with. And you see the month of February in comparison to Last year, looks like we're about twelve hundred dollars, eleven hundred dollars, a thousand dollars more from that range. <coughs> and uh, you know, so overall, it's tracking very well, considering uh, you know some of the fluctuations in oil field activity. But I think that tells us that we have a much larger uh, flow of traffic and business activity in the community just continues to grow. The next couple of pages are actually the, the checks. So you see um, some legal advertising with the county news. Uh, you can see all those. You see the contract payment there. That's it.
Any other questions? Do have a motion to approve the treasurer's report? I'll move that we accept the treasurer's report. Second. Do we move and second to accept the treasurer's report as read? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <coughs> motion passes. Next, we're going to committee reports. First committee will be finance. Uh, nothing there. Nothing yet to say there. Second being personnel. None. Nothing report there. Now we're going to item for the executive officer's report. I'm, I'm going to hit these real fast because uh, this will be maybe a lengthy meeting, so I'm going to try to shorten it. Um, <clears throat> basically, uh, the auditors have been in and out, and uh, and you'll see that we have a choice of having a separate report or one within the city report uh, further uh, in our, our uh, packet. Uh, I guess uh, Henrietta's already gone through the SWOT analysis uh, at the breakfast meeting. Uh, we're getting uh, outside proposals for the marketing materials and so forth. Uh, we, um, Ray, the city manager, development manager, our director, and myself met with two outside investors that have 19.5 acres under contract um, that's adjacent to the, uh, I don't see the sign on it, but people call it the Catholic Cemetery. On the right hand side of the road as you're going out. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there's 19.5 acres there. They want to build um, office, office warehouse, uh, and uh, try to have septic on two and a half acre uh, lots. And uh, south of the cemetery. Yeah. Is that Lopez's old place? Yeah. It must be. And so we we met to discuss that with with the city. Um, and then the uh, the March meeting is is been delayed until March the 25th. This is spring break this week, uh, so people were out. And the next week, uh, the cha the chambers having their luncheon, and uh, said that it was too much activity in one day to have a breakfast and the luncheon. And I need their members to be there. So uh, it's the 25th now, and. Uh, then we'll be back on schedule next month. Uh, and I think that's it. <clears throat> we have a motion to approve the executive officer report. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, we need to approve no. that. Okay. How serious are these people that are not can and have acres? I think they're under contract, feasibility yeah. period. Okay. And, and the meeting with the city was to, you know, during that feasibility period, mm -hmm. what are we going to have to do to satisfy the city, and what is that going to cost, so forth. So, but that's already in, in progress now. There, there are investors going to do something over there. Already. Under contract, it's not a done. It's never done until they, they pay for it. But it's it's under con, under feasibility. So, what what is there anything we need to do? Or? Not at this point. I think Tommy's been cooperative with them as well as Henrietta, and I don't think there's anything that needs to be done from this side other than provide information as needed. We've, I've, uh, you know, Ray and I and Henrietta have had multiple meetings with these people. Um, they've got a lot, a lot of money behind them, and so, you know, the hope is that if they can get this project going, that they may say, we like Floresville, we'll invest some more money, and that's not a problem as far as money goes. Any other questions? <clears throat> we'll look to item number five, status updates on the industrial park entrance side. You know, uh, in the courtesy of the out-of-town guests, would it be okay with the board if we allowed them to go before Harry and said, okay, Harry, you bet. since you're here local, you bet. That, would anybody object to that? Or Mr. President, what do you think about that? I think it's fine it. Hmm? Oh, he's not feeling well? Okay, well then. No, go ahead, go ahead, I'm fine. 
I'm fine. I'm just old it's just Laura. It's, it's, up, it's up to the board. I'm not doing CPR on you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Believe me, Besides, we have I a nurse. Many out of town presentations. I always appreciate it when they do that for me. So, with that being said, we have kind of everybody's in agreement. Item number six with Mr. Heimer. Send us update on Rancho Grande Industrial Park drainage and road paving project. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, also with me tonight, uh, Brian Interling with D&D is here. Uh, he, he's going to give you a perspective from his side. But I'll kind of go through and summarize kind of the, the project status and kind of where we are. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with where the project is. But just to kind of, I don't know if y'all can see this or not, but uh, I'll try to spread it out here. Uh, the project, you know, includes uh, putting in uh, asphalt pavement and concrete pavement sections on both the Rancho Grande from FM 537 to the dead end and also Cardinal from end to end. And then it also includes a significant drainage and a channel back through the gas frack side and on down to this point where the water leaves the project. And there's also some pipe culverts in these in this intersection area. But uh, the, the project uh, was bid out last fall. D&D uh, &D was the low bidder. Uh, the contract amount was about $991,000. Uh, they started their work in December. Uh, right now, uh, based on, there, there have been three payment applications submitted. I think the third one is still in progress, I believe. Uh, but the total amount of uh, money that's been earned to date is a little over 42% of the contract. And that's about where we are today. Uh, the contract time, uh, they should require that they complete the project about the end of, of May. So the end of May, first part of June, will be the end of the, the time that's in the current contract. They have experienced a lot of bad weather issues, and there may be some additional time given there. But at this point in time, you know, our, our plan is to is to work with them as closely as possible, and hopefully weather cooperates if we get this finished by the end of May. Uh, they, uh, the, the pavement section is uh, basically meets the, I guess the asphalt pavement section meets the uh, Wilson County standard. It's got 10 inches of flexible base or more, and then the double surface treatment. And then we have reinforced concrete pavement at certain areas where we expect heavy truck traffic. Uh, we have concrete at the intersection of, of Cardinal and uh, Rancho Grande, plus a little bit further toward the south where the main truck entrance comes out of gas rack and out of this adjacent facility here. And then we have, uh, we're extending concrete pavement along the front here back to the first two big driveways that come in off of these two sites that have quite a bit of truck traffic. So we have gone in and added concrete in the areas where we expect a lot of turning movements and trucks coming out on the roads to hopefully minimize their impact on that uh, county road pavement section. We're also putting in concrete driveways uh, where, where all the existing driveways are now, uh, plus a couple of extras for, new, for some new driveways. Uh, we obtained an easement from the Watkins Tank property, and in return for that, we've, we're putting two driveways into their facility. But uh, we, we chose concrete. Again, this is where the trucks are coming onto our, our road, and we wanted to create something substantial there so when they come out and go get on our road, we don't minimize the, the damage to our, our pavement. Again, it's uh, depending on the truck traffic, you know, it's going to potentially, you know, over time could be some maintenance issues there. But again, we, we, we uh, uh, as long as we can keep the major, you know, the kind of have the trucks, hopefully they're not loaded when they come in and come go out. Hopefully it's more of a storage facility, but that's that's been a concern. But again, we have uh, met or exceeded the county road section, and so we, uh, and then we added the extra concrete. So we hope that that'll minimize that problem. Uh, I guess at this point, uh, I can maybe let Brian talk a little bit about what he's been experiencing as a contractor. And I've got to say that I've checked this almost daily, and uh, the 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 um, the weather that some of, that they've been out there working has been uh, pretty intolerable. But they they somehow they managed to have work done where where they're in a cab with the heater on and they get it done. It's just <laughs> been incredible. Very pleased. Uh, what I did here 
was basically you put up the site plan and just kind of highlight it to let y'all see where we <coughs> progress on the job. Ray, can you say that okay? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. okay. As you see right here, I have the channel highlighted green. This channel is 100% excavated. We are going to have to go back up and dress it up since this rain kind of washed a little rut it out. But we are going to plan on getting this hydro mulch and water this next month. So we hopefully we'll have grass established by the time <coughs> we are finished with the whole project. Uh, everything you see highlighted yellow is the base road sections. This is 100% completed. We have installed over 12,000 tons of base on the whole sections, as per the plans called, 10 inches and above. Uh, the blue highlighted area is what we have poured in concrete already, and all the drainage pipes have been installed. So our main drainage structure over here with the channel, the pipes are installed, the concrete is being formed, but it has not been poured, but drainage, uh, this portion of the concrete drive has been poured. Uh, we've been con uh, communicating with the companies, let them know what's going on, so we make sure they get in and out. As of right now, our plan is, right now the gas rack's the main traffic that comes through here. We have them coming out of this entrance right here. As soon as we get this portion and this driveway poured, we plan on communicating with them, see if we can open up their fence line here and have them come out their backside. So we can pour this half section. And this will keep this traffic flowing this way. And after we get that poured, this, this truck come out this way or that way. There's really not much heavy traffic trucks coming this way, so we'll pour it half and half so they can get out. And if it comes a problem where the trucks can't get in, we're, we'll discuss about putting a temporary drive through here if it's an option, yeah. if we can't get them in and out, just depending on the turn radius of the rigs that come through. Uh, other than that, everything's going smoothly. We have only just had 14 days of rain in the last two months, which hasn't really helped us out too much, but we just try to stay on top of it, and I think we should be done, hopefully, middle of May. Some of the issues there are potentially two other entrance, entrances that are concrete entrances to this property, is that correct? But they're on private property, but there are two other um, sleeves, the same size as our entrance. But, but not, one's to our, on, not to our property. Uh, no, one's to in the Unahoven, which is north. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then one is to. It's uh, part of the building. This land is sold. Yeah, it's well, it part like of it was. Yeah. It's part yeah. of the park, but but the one um, up the road from our entrance is Unahoven, and the other one um, back toward uh, 181 is uh, uh, F and W Electric. So there's no requirement for us to put any roads for those two. No, they have property. access. They have access to FM. Right, I understand that. There's no requirement for us to put in the same type of roads for these. No, no. Okay, no. okay. Um, I had a question. What if, you mentioned Watco. Watkins. 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 No, in some of the springs. There'll be a different. T K I S different. Different Watkins. Oh, okay. Then it was spelled correctly. The Watkins tank. I'm sorry, I thought you said. I think they purchased that twenty something acres there, I believe. This drainage drains into what? There's a natural natural drainage level there. Meets all the requirements. No flooding problems. We're not creating trouble for somebody else. Well, again, there's there's also a plan that we showed some detention areas. One was in this area here. I'm not sure what the status of that is. One here, one down here where this uh, where the big drain comes to, and a small one over here. I believe this one's going to be done by FNW, but there are a couple of detention areas that we have identified that should be uh, installed at some point. For to be counted. Right now, at the end of, of that green uh, where it makes an L, there's a, a 70 by 300 foot yeah. It's going to be graded so we can match as closely as possible that existing drainage pattern. And that's a, basically a holding pattern for the water. But then as soon as we get through with this, we want to hopefully contract the same company to build the retention pond. It's right in this area right here. And that will catch What's all the status of resolving that with the county? Uh, I don't think there's any. Who's that on to resolve that? 
<clears throat> uh, they have not backed down at all. They've been uh, less demanding, for lack of a better choice of words, but they've not walked away from they don't want the, the industrial park and they do want the uh, retention park. So we are under a mandate to get the detention ponds done, uh, and we begged off until after the and we spent the money on the roads. But I keep uh, I keep the county commissioner informed. I invite him to go see what's going on, and uh, he's gone out there. So I think Paul is, as far as I know, he's still waves at me and he's happy. So the, the communication is much better now. We've kind of gotten away from. Uh, the, the ugly letters and the, the, all the stuff in the paper and no offense to the paper, but we've, there, there's kind of a lot of communication now and they're being uh, understandable and agreeable. Does the county actually sign off on the work that's been done already? Excuse me. Do, do they sign off on that? I believe so. I believe each, each individual has to go in there and I believe uh, they have, uh, like, gas rack has their own little extension pond several of sites that have a lot of impervious cover have built their own detention ponds to uh, mitigate any excess runoff coming off site. But they have been, they have seen what's going on, but they didn't see the preliminary plans and what was going to happen, so they're, it's not a strange document to them. And I got Craney Cheeseman signed by Gas Frack and, and uh, Mr. Watkins, uh, and that was some trade-off, you know, um, his two entrances instead of one. But um, I've not heard a word from anybody that one of the biggest challenges on this whole project, and we were stalled for a long time, is that green line. And that green line looks like a little bit of thing, but you've not been out there. That's a big thing, right? It was designed to be very shallow and keep the water as slow as possible, and try to uh, not, you know, it was not a concrete line channel that would just come off the side of you know, it's, it's but unfortunately that size is what's required to meet the county requirement so it's, it's just the way it is but I would recommend that that pond at some point in time has to be built once in more impervious cover goes in it's going to become a concern because we uh, there will be an increase of runoff on the neighbor's property but we are again we are spreading it out trying to match exactly what's there but it's still it's important to get built at some point <coughs> Once all this is finished, I'm going to have um, the remaining piece uh, west, no, south, east, or, uh, west of Gas Rack uh, surveyed because that channel, you know, it's easy to say a 60 foot channel, but when you go out <coughs> of it, 60 feet is, is a darn wide channel. And so the remaining land. You know, if they piled up the dirt and smooth and smoothed it out, yeah. so we have a different landscape now mm -hmm. uh, to to our benefit. But uh, have that uh, appraised and then try to get it marketed. I'm going to ask a look, not appraised. Really I'm sorry. Question. Survey. But because we've got this type of a channel here, do we have, to have any kind of signage about beware, like McDonald's and coffee's hot? And there could be water in here. Don't jump in it. Uh, well, it's uh, the, the typical standard is you, you could, I mean, a, a lot of cases because it's a shallow channel, it's not like a you're dropping off six feet or eight feet okay. of water. It's probably got about two and a half feet of water in it and three feet of water in it, so it's not very deep. It's hard for me to say not to put a barricade in front of it, but the typical standard or kind of the way the normal county, city handles these sort of things, it, because it's a very gradual slope off the road down toward the channel and it's very shallow they typically would not put a barricade there but again I, it's hard for me to say don't put one there yeah. they put up we could put some guard posts there county guard posts there but uh, maybe that's something in the future you may want to do but uh, again it's a shallow channel and it's hard for me to say it's not required but this the typical standard of care that you see in the county and the cities on something like this you don't see a guardrail there but is there any kind of signage that we should have to protect ourselves? Well, I would again, you recommend. I mean, I would. Uh, we can look at see what's up, what's out there. I'll come back to you with a recommendation. To put something there again. I can't tell you not to put something there. I'd recommend that if there's a concern, any kind of concern, regarding that, that we put something there. Yeah. You know, well, you know. well I, you know, anybody knows that a cup of coffee's going to be hot. 
Right. Well, and that. I mean, it's, it's kind of an industrial setting. If it, if it were a retail center, definitely we put yeah. that. <coughs> yeah. But it's kind of an industrial park type setting, and it's not like you have retail customers coming yeah. in through to get out kids and that kind of thing. So I that's why maybe it's not too big. What would be the cost? Of I think I agree with the other percent. It's probably going to be, you know, what, 35, 40 bucks a foot to put something along there? Are you talking like a guardrail? Probably or maybe county guard or signage or something. Yeah, just, just what I, I, mean, I, I would say true. err in favor or omit, uh, omitting something that might come, even if it doesn't. I mean, like you. I'm just trying to think of what we could put there. We could put signs every 50 feet, beware channel, a channel. I mean, you know, a little water crossing, whatever, but something that, you know, put it nice. with a wire through it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, what do you think about it? I mean, I, yeah. I, just, I mean, again, I mean, I think if you're going to, if you're concerned about someone driving into it, I would recommend just putting a county standard guardrail section along there. You know, guard post, or even maybe that, because there's really no speed involved. Maybe you don't need to have the rail, but maybe guard post at some spacing with some, you know, with a little butter drives. I mean, those are we could do that kind of thing, which is maybe more typical for a county type rep section. But that could also, you know, hopefully keep someone from wanting to play four wheel drive or whatever. Well, that's sure, I'm running on my button. Well, for that, you'd almost have to put like a guardrail or, or a cable or something, some standard type things you see on the road to keep from actually dropping in there. I do know the county's having some, some problems and yeah. issues now with people that are just going out and, and, and having mud races on all the county well, that's, roads. That's kind of you know, I do have another question. You know, that bridge you cross over, the, that was yeah. already there. Yes. Are we going to put any kind of guardrails on that thing? We have, well, it's, it's the, we've got very, very, very gradual slopes. It's 18 inch pipes. We're putting uh, reflectors at each end on both sides. Where it uh, delineates where the where the uh, structure ends or where the road ends, but we don't have a guardrail. No, I'm talking about that existing. Yeah, you're talking about yeah. right here. The oh, there. Conservation yeah. area, yeah. There. Yeah. and that doesn't have anything there. Yeah. And, and I've often thought that's not. We probably need to check into that because you could easily put a guardrail on that. Um, but it's yeah. open. Yeah, you can put it on there. I mean, it's got a board, but I guess a board log about come drill. Sure. Yeah. But that's I'll, something I still wanted to mention, though, because it needs to be looked at. Maybe you can check it well, out. I, well, I'll do is I'll put together a little drawing in front of Master Tommy, and then we'll send it to Brian to uh, <coughs> see what it is okay. and uh, add something to it. Yeah, I think reflectors and if something, because you can drive off. Each side of that group yeah. of that. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about. I was thinking about this one here. This one here, we did make these side slopes like four to one, very gradual. but only this pipes are this deep, and we do have reflectors on on both both directions and going on both sides of the road. In many years. In many years now. But yeah. I'll, I'll check into that and get y'all some information about putting a guardrail on here. I think we're talking about probably guard post and metal beam, right? Probably. Yeah. Of the you do the Santana delineator so they can see it. Yeah, that's well, as a minimum, delineator so they can <clears> see it when it's raining or at night time. Does anyone have any more questions? And uh, we should be installing a new 8 inch water pipe this next month, which was the deduct change order that we submitted last month. Yeah, what that was is when we looked at this job, we didn't know where the water main was elevation wise. We were concerned there would be a conflict in this area. And also coming down here, we thought there might be some conflicts. Well, there, uh, there was no conflicts in this area, but there was a conflict here as we anticipated. And so, uh, and then we found also that this last section of pipe here was instead of being an eight inch, it was a four inch. And because these sites could require a larger amount of volume, fire flow, instead of replacing with four inch, we just replaced it with eight inch. Or that's what the change order covered. But, but the bottom line is, it was a, a deduct of like $26,000 in the contract. Because we had anticipated more, but it wasn't as much as we thought it was. So we were able to reduce the, the cost of it down. Based on what Brian said, it sounds like y'all have done a really good job in maintaining good relationships with the people out there. Yes, we've and been trying to stay. really important. I mean, especially with a live street, we have to. Yeah. We don't want to attract anybody or anything that's <coughs> going on as much as y'all do. 
especially with the uh, when we start pulling these side driveways, because we will have to pour them in two pours because most of these people only have one driveway, so we will do half pours on them, and they'll have a, <coughs> a joint in the middle of it. And, but there are some companies that do have two driveways, like this, the them and them, and Cash Rec has this driveway, and hopefully we can see if they can come out of here later. So. It's been absolutely quiet with the um, the folks out there, so that's good news. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, did y'all want to keep this for y'all's records? Yeah. Y'all yeah. more than that. Uh, Next item number seven is presentation by Aaron Farmer with Retail Coach <clears throat> to represent Floresville FDC in the city to nationwide retailers doing business in markets similar to Floresville and actually bring new retailers including restaurants to Floresville to conduct business. Just and can I say one thing? Um, the, the, the agenda reflects that uh, there could be a possible action item um, in the in the process in the meantime of that going out um, I have another company that wants um, their time to present so that we'll have four companies when this all ends so we're not going to vote we're not going to go into executive session tonight we're going to listen to uh, Aaron's presentation and then um, Henrietta and I are trying to line up something for the fourth person and that may come in at next month's meeting and then we'll get out to make a decision. Awesome. Well, th thank you for letting us be here. We appreciate it. Um, my name's Aaron Farmer, uh, Senior Vice President of the Retail Coach. We actually have a, a history with Ford Bowl and, and I'll talk about that as we go forward. And I've actually been in town since about noon today and just really, I, I don't live too far from here. I, I live in Dripping Springs and I work in Austin. So it takes me an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes to get down here. And, Wanted just to, to re-familiarize myself. I've been working on with Forge Wilson about 2007, 2008 time period. So I put together a short presentation. Actually, you have a copy of the presentation in that folder I have if, if you want to follow through. If not, no problem. Um, real quick, a little, for, for those of you that don't know about our firm, uh, the Retail Coach, we've, we've been doing this for about 15 years. Um, we work with economic development corporations, uh, municipalities, to actually go out and recruit retailers and restaurants, but also to work with with local businesses as well, help them uh, expand and retention, those sort of things. We also focus on downtowns as well, and you know, just many time, spending time in the community today, um, it, it just reminds me of the submarkets here. Um, you, you've got two or three submarkets in Floresville. You've got the the 181 submarket there, which is more of your regional type submarket. You can almost you can almost break 181 into two different submarkets. Um, it's north and north and south. But then you've also got the downtown as a submarket as well. And, it's very important to look at each of those sub-markets individually. What's going to go out there by Walmart is not going to be the same as what goes out into downtown and those sort of things. So that being said, I just I wanted to, to, to spend enough time here. I had a chance to go in and talk to a number of the, the managers at the retail stores um, just to get a feel for how the stores were doing, especially our new retailers. And it, it was just it was, it was kind of fun to, to kind of interact with some of those that we've talked to before. But our background, we worked in over 300 communities, but we are focused on Texas. Um, I uh, am out of our Austin office. I grew up just north of Fort Worth. Um, but about half of those projects, if not more, have been worked in Texas, and specifically around the greater San Antonio area, South Texas, Austin area. So one of the things I wanted to hit on here is it's, it's not only about what you know, but it's also about who you know. I graduated from, from Texas A&M University, got my MBA from Texas A&M Commerce, and had a professor always tell me it's not, about, not necessarily about what you know, it's about who you know. And that is extremely true in the retail real estate business. And these relationships that we've built uh, with retailers here, with developers that have actually done projects here, they're, they're gonna, if you help them locate in one community, they're gonna listen to you again, especially if it's a successful store. So I wanted to hit on that. If we get the chance to continue to work with you, uh, the three of us will be the project leaders on this project. One thing different from me and my competitors is I'm not a salesperson. I'm actually working these projects, every single one of them. Back in 2007 when we started this project, I was here. 
Um, Kelly Kofer founded our company. He was a site selector for Hancock Fabrics. Back in the 80s and 90s when they were doing very well, uh, he, would, he would open up stores throughout Texas, throughout the U.S. Founded the Retail Coach to help really small to medium sized communities. And those are our focus. Our, our community is really the size of floors. My background, um, I already mentioned I went to Texas A&M University. Um, I uh, previously have <coughs> done some work in uh, consulting for FedEx Kinko's, National Association of Subway Franchises, IHOP, helping them decide where to locate their stores. Um, I also lead the retail portion of the basic economic development course. So all new economic developers coming into the industry in Texas, really throughout the U.S., if they want to be certified as an economic developer, the first place they have to go is the basic economic development course. And I lead that uh, every year. I lead that basic course. So you get to interact with communities throughout the U.S. And then Joseph Kuhn, he, his, his background is in leasing and development. Uh, but the three of us would be the ones you see on an everyday basis, not every day, but when we're here in the community uh, working to, to locate retailers and restaurants. We've got a great support staff back in the office. You would see some of these, uh, some of these in the community. Kelly and myself um, really have tried to build the strongest uh, team that we can that have the experience that worked with retailers, um, <coughs> people on our team that have worked with Fortune 500 companies helping them locate stores. So, so really that's our background there. A couple more slides about the retail coach. You know, one of the things um, that's important is to look at other communities that we've worked in that are similar size and, and similar in a similar region. Um, if you're familiar with, with Wilberti, Texas, uh, right on 281 there, you've probably seen the dirt moving on, on right there on the northwest corner of 281 and, and Wilberti there. That's, <coughs> that's the Singing, Singing Hills retail development. I believe it's number two or number three in the state as far as retail developments go. We've been uh, the consultant for that project since day one. Um, have, have built those relationships there. Buda, Texas, uh, if you know Buda, uh, Buda's where Cabela's is. You've seen all of that retail happen there. Buda's a town of about 7,300. If you saw in the paper today, it's, it's one of the fastest growing communities in, really in the nation. Um, been successful at recruiting a number of, number of different retailers and restaurants there. There was a Mexican restaurant that just announced uh, next to Cabela's there. CBS Pharmacy has just announced uh, a new HEB. So a lot, of, a lot of things happening there. A couple more, Bastrop, Texas. I really look at Bastrop and Floresville, uh, just, just in the size of the community, but where you're situated, very similar. We've uh, worked with Bastrop since 2011, and we've been successful at recruiting roughly 15 retailers and restaurants. Everybody from Academy to Hobby Lobby to Chick-fil-A, you name it, we've helped locate there. New Braunfels, Texas, if you know the town center at Creekside, where BJ's Brewhouse is, where the new Longhorn Steakhouse, all of that, we were the consultant for that project as well. And then the last one, Gonzales, Texas. Gonzales, there's a lot going on in Gonzales if you've been out there recently. They've got the new HEB, the new Walmart. Um, the old Walmart's been, we helped find a developer for that project where they actually have um, several different retailers that have gone in there. So a lot happening there. Um, Factory Connection, Dollar Tree, AT&T, new Walmart, new HEB. So just wanted to show you that we know this area. And, and one of the things that's key is retailers have site selectors. And, and typically, because Texas is so large, there's a site selector that's over Austin and San Antonio, this region here. And, and it's key to work with somebody, in, in, in my opinion, what I recommend, that has that relationship where they can call up, you know, if, whether it's Ken Espenson or Scott Espenson, you might know the names there, that are brokers for major projects. We've got the ability, having just done a Chili's deal, to be able to call up Chili's and say, look, this is a market you need to look at. And actually, back in 2008, 2011, through 2011, we actually reached out to Chili's. And Chili said, hey, this is a market that we plan for expansion. So already having those relationships, we can kind of pick up the phone and, and, and reiterate those, get the meetings set up. So last few slides um, about us, and I want to talk about affordable. Uh, the retail coach strategy and assistance has netted us over 325,000 square feet of <coughs> retail development. Wiley, Texas, up in just east of Dallas there. We were just hired back two weeks ago to work with Wiley for our third time. We're, we were successful at now it's close to 500,000 square feet of retail, anchored by a Target shopping center there. Target's not doing any deals anywhere, and we were able to get them to go to Wiley. And it was all about our analysis and, and what we do there, so it's something we pride ourselves on. And then this is from Dave Quinn and Bastrop. Talked about all that success we've had in Bastrop. Um, for years, our research firms have helped me with retail development. Over and over again, I heard about their service after the sale. You see a lot of firms that can run, the, run data, put together reports. Um, what allows the retail coach to stand out is their coaching. So I just kind of summarize that. But what sets us apart is the relationships we have and the coaching. 
86% of our clients are repeat business, and it's because we are successful. If you go into a community and, and you can show them that the, the cost of doing this strategy with you, you pay for it in the first one, two, three years, they're likely to do something. So that's something we really pride ourselves on, and really, really pride ourselves on just kind of the standard in Texas. And uh, having grown up here, retailers want to be in Texas. Developers want to be in Texas. We, we work with them throughout there. So I already talked about Bastrop, but Chick-fil-A, Dunkin' Donuts, Hobby Lobby, Academy. Uh, this was a fun project to work on. If you know Southside uh, Market and Barbecue, they're in Elgin. Well, they opened up their second location in Bastrop. And we worked extremely closely with them to do that. And if you haven't been there, you need to, you need to check it out because it was a fun project for me, but for the community, I couldn't believe it, but Bastrop only had one barbecue restaurant, and it, it was only open on the weekends. So Southside came in, and it's it's a hit. I mean, you, you can hardly get in there. So just just some successes we've had, and I wanted to share that with you. Um, but here's our experience in Floresville. We were hired back in 2000, the 2007-2008 time period to do, to do a similar recruitment strategy, um, where we put together the analysis, the reports, and I will tell you, we were successful. Um, it took a couple of years on some of these retailers, but we made the, we made the first contacts. Um, we identified a customized retail trade area where we actually came in and hand drew your trade area, where it extended. It didn't extend as far to the west as it did, maybe to the north and the south and the east just because of competition. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. But the retail coach, we reached out to about 25 retailers and restaurants, and I was actually sitting in the car before I came in here, and it was closer to 40 that we reached out to. But uh, worked very closely with Walmart Supercenter. When they were deciding to come, we did a lot of the reports and, and helping them to, to, to make that, that move to expand there. Um, Little Caesars, uh, we made the first contact with Little Caesars. Uh, Whataburger was another one. And then also uh, Cato Fashions. And Rue 21. Rue 21, I know they opened in 2013. I was looking back at our notes. We reached out to them in 2008. So um, just kind of in a nutshell, just really quickly, not to pull out all the reports, but we have done this for you. We've done a lot of the research and we need to update some of that research, but the work is there. Understanding who's a fit here, having already set up these relationships. So I wanted to mention that to you. Looking at 2011, your retail sales in 2011 were 221 million, roughly 221 million. Got that number from the comptroller's office. Now, just look at the comptroller's office before I came in here, you're up to 330 million. Now, it's the expansion of Walmart and some of those other things and, and, and the overall market, Eagle Ford, all of those things. That